There are, are serious problems in terms of protecting whistleblowers, encouraging whistleblowers, and we've seen that from the Gibbs and Nottingham research. Uh, and we have certainly seen a rise of whistleblowers in South Africa over the past few years, many coming forward to the State Capture Commission from Timba Moseko uh, to Mkabisi Jonas uh, to Martha Ngoy, Cynthia, many others as well. And the president, in his closing remarks to the Zondo Commission, said, whistleblowers have not had a great time in our country, uh, understatement of anything. Once they blew the whistle, they've been subjected to enormous pressures, pressures that have affected them personally, professionally, career-wise, and have also affected their own households. There have been brave men and women in our country who, because of corruption, blew the whistle. I regret that in some instances they have not been treated well. And then the Chief Justice Raymond Zondo also uh, saying very recently at the News 24 conference, the Commission has heard a lot of evidence from whistleblowers. If we do not look after these whistleblowers during state capture, they won't be around next time, which is very ominous indeed. So, Prof, I'll start with you. There have been recommendations made in the Zondo Commission report around whistleblowing. Uh, today, in fact, for those of you who don't know, is the deadline for government and the president to respond to the Zondo Commission. So we could well see some kind of recommendation in the next 24 hours around whistleblowing, around legislation. What were the recommendations? What, what could be done? Thank you very much, um, Mandy. Um, thank you, Justice Khampem. At the end of um, the report, the Chief Justice had initially isolated a group of, um, of recommendations. I think the intention was to highlight um, the more prominent ones that he had penned. When we got the opportunity to make corrections, not amendments, corrections, <laughs> to the report recently, the Chief Justice decided that it was important to draw all the recommendations out of the entire 19, set of 19 volumes of the Commission uh, out into a separate volume so that when people want to reach for them, they should not have to read the 6,000 pages uh, of the report. Um, in fact, when I was just saying to someone earlier that when, when we asked to go and make some corrections and people were kind of moaning about it, the Chief Justice said to me, I'm surprised that after so many weeks or months, people only realize now that there were corrections to be made. But there are some of us uh, who have read 6,000 pages of the Zondo Commission report. So, so it was very important to, to crystallize them all in one dedicated volume out of the 19 volumes. And so they are there, they are reachable, they are straightforward, they are powerful. Um, they are the product of uh, three and a half years, four years maybe, uh, of the work of the Commission. Not only Zondo, there were legal men and women, South Africans, uh, many of whom went without being paid for many, many months and continued to do the work. Uh, investigators that had to be kept uh, protected, that to this date nobody except those of us who are inside know who they were, not all of us, even then. Uh, they had to be protected because of the toxicity, toxicity of the situation in our country. Um, they have worked hard alongside the judge uh, to produce um, the, the 19 volumes and now the recommendations. It is up to the president, it is up to parliament um, to now um, make good for the people of South Africa. We've seen the contribution made by whistleblowers in the pushback against corruption, and, and whistleblowers are crucial. We would never have had the Gupta leaks, as an example, 
which effectively brought down a presidency. And today we still do not know um, who, or at least publicly do not know who the, the Gupta Leaks whistleblowers were. Their lives have been uh, irrevocably changed. How important has the contribution of whistleblowers been in the fight against state capture and, and capturing the state? Thanks, Mandy. And Gideon, thanks for the event. Well done uh, to Gibbs. Um, they are extremely important. You know, without whistleblowers, we're not going to even start to dent the fight against corruption. They are so critical. We meet with whistleblowers daily, um, and, and, and we see this dilemma that they face. Uh, they know that something is extremely wrong. They can see what's going down. And if they keep quiet, their conscience is extremely stroked and uh, under pressure and, uh, as individuals. So these are really, really courageous and good people. And if we don't make their lives easier to get the information, we cannot do a thing about corruption because fighting corruption is about getting the information and it comes from within. So the saddest thing that we see so often is that um, they don't know where to go. Internally, in companies and in, and in the public sector, the whistleblowing systems that are introduced are compromised very often. Uh, and even if they try and use them, and that's probably the wrong route to go sometimes because then they are found out and that's the end. Uh, and the modus operandi is to find ways to push them aside, vilify them, bully it, them. It becomes a witch hunt, essentially. It's a witch hunt, and, 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 and they, they get suspended for arbitrary reasons. And that's when the fight starts, and then they realize that uh, maybe I should have just kept quiet. Maybe I shouldn't have done anything. And Cynthia will elaborate, uh, Martha and Goya, there's so many of them uh, uh, out there. And we are seeing more and more whistleblowers now not wanting to come forward. We get the information uh, 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 anonymously, and when we want to engage, they just do not want to reveal who they are because of this fear, because of what they've seen with Babita and, and others out there being ostracized. And that is the saddest situation we can find ourselves in as a country. And I don't know why it is so difficult. The two sides to this issue is government and there's business. Because I think uh, it was David Lewis who'd, uh, from Corruption, which you first well, I first heard it, you know, business is the other side of the corruption coin when it comes to state capture mm -hmm. uh, and just dealing with the state. <clears throat> and this is what worries me when we, when we engage with, with executives in businesses and in, and in the public sector is that if you sit around the table with them and say, do we agree that anyone in your organization that can expose corruption or wrongdoing is a hero? Do you believe that these people are important to you? And um, the normal answer is absolutely, yes, we need them. But on, when the reality uh, uh, takes place, they are nowhere to be seen. And so it's so sad that people like Cynthia and, uh, and others that really find it difficult. I mean, I, if I was a CEO of a company, a chairperson, I would be beating the door down to bring people like Cynthia in to have in our organization to root out uh, corruption to mm -hmm. make sure that this type of stuff doesn't happen, but that's not the case. Right. They find themselves on the other side of the fence. We absolutely need a, a societal revolution in how we treat whistleblowers as well. They should be given national orders and appointed as, as ethics officers, which is just not the case. In most instances, uh, somebody like Bianca Goodson has sent out 2,000 CVs and remains unemployed, yet 695 million rand has been returned to the fiscus because of her whistleblowing. Uh, and, and that is the lived reality, Cynthia, of whistleblowers in South Africa. Uh, and everybody loves a whistleblower until it happens in their own organization, right? What, what has the experience been like for you? Mandy, on behalf of all the other whistleblowers that are here present today and the ones that um, we don't even know about, the ones whose names never make the media, is that it's a lonely journey. You don't decide to be a whistleblower. You don't wake up the, uh, one morning and say, I'm a whistleblower. It's a journey that you take when you see as you started out, when somebody sees something wrong in the organization, it's either going against the policies or the procedures or they forcing you to sign something that you know is wrong. And you then stand up, you push back, you reject it, you decide I'm not doing this. But you're doing it with loyalty in your heart, loyalty for that organization. You are following the, 
the principles and policies of the organization, and you are behaving ethically. The end result is totally the opposite. You don't expect it. You don't expect to be retaliated. You don't expect to be suspended, to be pushed aside with trumped up charges, that every word you say um, is used against you and turned around, where they collude behind your back to find people to give misinformation about you. So the experience is harsh. It is so harsh and I do not wish this on anyone. However, I have hope that if we stand together, this is where Wayne's bringing out there are less whistleblowers coming forward now. And we need to encourage them because how else do you then get rid of corruption? How else are you able to stop something happening within your organization if you one voice alone? And um, if I may just add about the voice, my personal experience is that there's an irony in the word whistleblowing, in that when you blow that whistle, it is loud and clear and piercing and everybody looks to hear the sound. But for a whistleblower, when they whistleblow, they are strangled, they are muffled, and everyone tries to hide that voice. So it's such an irony. And it's a harsh experience. I think for all those, we hope they can give their voices later in discussions and questions. But it is indeed a lonely journey to suffer. Mm. And, and the truth is that for many people, it would be far easier to just join in the looting. Uh, and, and the fact that many of the whistleblowers who went to the State Capture Commission had that opportunity and instead chose to, to do the right thing, which took enormous moral courage. And, and Justice Kampepe, if, if anybody has exemplified moral courage in handing down uh, your very well publicized judgment involving the former president, uh, it, it is you indeed, when it comes to moral courage. How important is that moral courage when speaking out in defense of the Constitution, in defense of doing the right thing? I think it is very, very important. Without moral courage, I think this country would go into decay. We need to be true to ourselves. When we are lawyers, we are lawyers because we are there to stand for the truth. As judges, we are as a symbol of that truth in what we do. And with moral courage, there comes the satisfaction that by telling the truth, the best of the results of the day will, will be realized. Mm. Moral courage is very important in that it frees your being into a state of true self. You realize what your true intentions are in life. With moral courage, you really are a reflection of what your professionalism has molded you to become. With moral courage, you really are a reflection of what society expects of us as individuals with Ubuntu must be. Where do you believe that moral courage comes from? It's, it's a function of a whole lot of things. Let me just share a, a little, it's not a story, experience. In the 70s, I was writing a master's dissertation in Manchester at the university there, and I wanted to write about justice. I come out of um, a really hot struggle in South Africa at the time, and um, I, want, I was looking for a camp. I wanted to fight. I hadn't gone out to study. I ended up um, studying and writing a dissertation, and so I chose the subject of justice. My supervisor, who was an exile from Latvia, uh, he had come in with parents a long time ago. 
tried to convince me to write on corruption, <laughs> and I refused. Would have been prescient. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and, and we didn't agree, he tried to convince me, we didn't agree, I wrote on justice. Because that's what I was coming back to do when I come back home. And many years later, um, I had written on justice at several, in several kinds of dissertations over time. An honors dissertation on re violent revolution and justice, a master's um, dissertation on just social justice, and a PhD justice on the uh, uh, black, black consciousness movement and the struggle for justice in South Africa. Um, many years later, I realized that I should have written my dissertation on corruption. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have been well ahead of your time <laughs> in this country. And, and the reason for that is that I discovered that justice cannot be built on corrupt foundations. It just does not stand. I spent all my life on the issue of justice, and I've tried to construct the just society. It's falling apart because the conditions, the foundations are wrong. And it's the ethical thing that's been raised here, the ethical courage. Um, but it's also the, 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 the willingness to die for the truth. I come from a movement, I come from the Black Consciousness Movement, not the Black Consciousness Party, the Black Consciousness Movement, Steve Biko's movement. In that movement, we took the decision to die, and we died in many numbers, culminating in Steve Bantu Biko. And it seems to me that unless we are prepared to die for the truth, it's not only about business, it's not only about government, it's also about society. The society must be able to say we will again go back to war for the truth and for integrity and for ethics. We cannot live in a society like this one. The way that society looks at whistleblowers is that snitches get stitches. That's what we teach our kids and that's why we speak about the fact that we need the societal revolution, which means we need to change things. We need to change the way we speak about whistleblowers Moral courage is one thing, but we also need a, a conducive environment um, in order to, we need that culture of dissent, right? But we also need to facilitate that. So the, the Gibbs Ethics and Governance Think Tank, uh, the, the research that was done with the Nottingham Business School, uh, identified the barriers to blowing the whistle. And this includes fear of job loss, long-term financial insecurity, uh, fear of vict uh, an experience of victimization, fear of breach of confidentiality. The list is long. What do we need to do, Wayne, to make it easier for whistleblowers to come forward? So that's where civil society comes in, and the Whistleblower House and Corruption Watch, ARTA. We have to do this work because government fails and business fails to do so. So it's not rocket science. All of those things you listed that comes out of the research is, should be provided for. So if I was in government, I'd put five billion rand, 10, because you'll recoup that within a few months, every year. So it's very difficult. You put it into an institution that is totally independent, that provides all that protection yeah. to those individuals, makes it easy for them to give mm. the information, and takes the investigations from that and puts it into a special place within the criminal justice system with courts that are focused on corruption because you know, judging on corruption is a science, it's a skill, you would understand the forensics of it. So if you build this independent institution supported by civil society, business and government, none of them own it, it's not difficult. And whistleblowers will come forward because A, they feel protected, B, they, their cases are going to be fought for them, uh, they have the funding to stay alive, and we, the country, and every citizen will benefit from the information. Now watch the behavior in these countries when that happens easier. Mm. And those individuals that are implicated are held accountable. We can wipe out corruption mm. literally overnight if you have a mindset of seriously dealing with corruption. But we go about this in circles. We make it difficult. We, we, we try and give birth to institutions. And, uh, and, and we sit years and years later after making statements that we're going to fight corruption. Mm. And we're in this current situation where it's getting worse. So I, I just don't understand why 
we continue to flounder at it. Why? Yeah. We, and it comes from leadership. It starts at the top. If you're serious about fighting corruption, you will get the people in the room. And I know that we have a national anti-corruption strategy, and there's a lot of good work being done. But it's slow. It's lethargic. Uh, we shouldn't be sitting here today as whistleblowers fearing for their lives today when we know what we know about corruption. So everyone's saying the right thing. We've had uh, the Chief Justice making the recommendations. The President has uh, said the right things at the Zondo Commission. But the reality is that every day we have stories like Babita Diokoran, who just a year ago is a senior health official in the Gauteng Health Department, uh, pushed back, exposed tender fraud at Tembisa Hospital, and was gunned down in a driveway after dropping her teenage daughter at school which, as you say, has got a chilling effect on other whistleblowers coming forward. Cynthia, how many panels have we sat on speaking about whistleblowing in the last uh, couple of years? Someone like Ethel Williams, who's left the country, won't even do interviews about it anymore because he says, what's the point? He has to go through it over and over again. So while these conversations are crucial, we actually need to see tangible change. You're the executive director of the Whistleblower House, which is an incredible organization, which we so badly need, but you need money, right? How else do you help whistleblowers if nobody's going to fund you? Where's corporate South Africa? So what we were doing as the whistleblower house was to fulfill a niche that was not there in the market. Um, we've had the lawyers, we've had um, where you can go to, we've had the Zonda Commission, we've had many discussions, many debates, many webinars, around whistleblowing, around corruption, and yet everyone says whistleblowers are heroes, they all recognize the fact that whistleblowers need support, and yet no one has provided that support. And through um, very few, I'd say um, Outa has corruption watch in, in many spheres, smaller organizations, but there wasn't one set area, global area, just to focus on assistance for whistleblowers. And that's where the initiative came up with Ben, who's sitting here in the audience, my colleague, Ben Theron, myself, Liesl Krinevald, um, Ivan, as mentioned earlier, Pele and Martha Nguya, um, had uh, got together to start this initiative. What we're looking at and how we're looking at to, to serve uh, and help whistleblowers and assist them is through the facets that the whistleblower follows. So it's basically is, what does a whistleblower need? They need legal advice and guidance. They suffer trauma, so they therefore need counseling or psychosocial help. They lose their job, so they're going to need financial um, assistance. They fear for their lives, so they're going to need security. And it is in that vein that we started looking at how best do we assist whistleblowers. And what we embarked on at the time then was negotiating with people with the skills. So we approached legal firms first saying, can you offer pro bono services to these whistleblowers? Because most often they have nothing. They've lost their jobs. The money they have can barely survive. It's the existing bills they need to pay. And can you assist with that? At this present time, we've got about nine legal firms that are assisting us with pro bono guidance and support and advice. However, when the whistleblower's case reaches litigation or needing to go to court, we're going to need to pay the lawyers. And at this point in time, we have no funds for that. The next part for the lawyer is, um, pardon for the whistleblower, is that they need, they, they, they don't even realize sometimes that they're suffering trauma and only recognize it through family saying, you need to go and see a doctor, or you need to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And so what we're offering them um, is this very assistance. We've partnered with the Psychological Society of South Africa, who has offered to give all our whistleblowers psychological help for three sessions. Should you need more, um, they, they then request for funds. So we're again looking for funds for the psychosocial assistance. The security, we've partnered with an organization who has provided um, funding for security for three of our whistleblowers, but I think they also limited in their funding. So we need more people to come on board because people like the, um, Babita Dio Koran should not have been killed. Yep. She was assisting the SIU. She should have been placed in a safe home, and she wasn't. 
And so for me, that should never have happened. And we don't want that to happen for another whistleblower. However, we've seen stories week after week, the Abathlali, um, there's been lots of assassinations around that, and how do we protect them? So we have to come up with a mechanism for, for assistance right. there. And then the last point is basically financial. I left it for last because that is our biggest challenge. We've spoken to the banks, no, no go there. We're currently in discussions with BUSA, BLA, we're in discussions with private um, funders, we've put out proposals to, to funding, um, in short, we insurance, need cash. and we need cash, and that's where we are. Civil society is essential in this, but we also need to overhaul the legislation. Uh, the Protected Disclosures Act, when it first came out many years ago, was seen as, as, as um, being very progressive. It's now described as a, a dinosaur uh, compared to legislation around the world. There were amendments made in 2017, but ultimately many whistleblowers say it's not worth the paper that it's, it's written on. Justice, in, if you look at the, the legal framework around whistleblowing in South Africa, what do you think could be done? There are options. Uh, the False Claims Act in America is one example. The Whistleblower House in the Netherlands is another example. How do we resolve this? Yes. I think we must take the Netherlands example of a Whistleblower House and try and improve on, the, on, on it in order to facilitate what is obviously taking taking over in our South African situation uh, with whistleblowing. So like a chapter nine organization? Like a chapter that, nine organization. That, that's what I'm in favor of. I think that would work well to have a government funded chapter nine institution that protects whistleblowers, but is independent from government. Yes. And do you see that happening? I think with much push, from civil society it can happen. <laughs>